On June 1st, a group of 26 technologists released a letter to regulators in Congress asking for increased scrutiny on cryptocurrency and Web3. I'm one of those technologists, and I'm in some pretty good company. Uh, hundreds more people have signed this letter in support uh, since then, and we're really asking for increased scrutiny and skepticism as Congress approaches the issue of crypto regulation. Um, but this is also me. <laughs> um, in 2013, I signed up with Coinbase. I started messing around with Bitcoin. Uh, my kids started mining Dogecoin in late 2013. And you know, I said, well, would it help if I let you use a stack of uh, servers that I'm not using right now? And he's like, sure. So we start messing around with Bitcoin or with Dogecoin and we accumulated around 30K worth of uh, Doge. But this is also me. Um, I'm a disinformation researcher. I've been working for the last uh, seven years or so specifically on the problem of disinformation, looking at social media data, and really digging into a lot of where this stuff has been coming from and why. And this has taken us into phenomena like QAnon and all to the people that created it, etc. So you might ask, like, where is this fork in the universe where I became, uh, you know, an anti-crypto person um, when I had been sort of interested in it back in like 2013? And to learn the answer to that question, we actually have to look at history and go back to 1933, to March 4th, 1933, in fact. This is where the big fork in the universe happened. So on March 4th, 1933, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was inaugurated. And he you know, came into office and wanted to implement a bunch of programs to help turn the country around you know, during the uh, Great Depression. And to do that, he needed to implement the New Deal. So in his first 100 days in office, he took a series of steps that just shocked the country. Um, he shut down banks for a week in order to prevent the hoarding of gold and silver. Um, he also passed uh, a uh, executive order that uh, specifically disallowed the private holding of, uh, of gold. Um, and he also uh, eliminated benefits for veterans uh, by passing the Economy Act. So what this did was it created a lot of enemies for Roosevelt very quickly, just within his first 100 days in office, including the American Legion, which was a very large uh, veterans organization, the Veterans of Foreign Wars, the National Association of Manufacturers, which is a huge organization of all of the country's biggest manufacturing companies. Uh, there's an organization called the American Liberty League, and then you had other big companies specifically like DuPont that were all allied together against um, uh, Roosevelt and the New Deal. So what they actually did was they proposed that they stage a coup and uh, basically try to overthrow the government in 1933-34. They asked a man named Smedley D. Butler, a major general who had served in the World War I, to lead an army of 500,000 super soldier veterans to go to Washington, D.C. and overthrow the government. Let's hear what Smedley Butler had to say in 1935. The Congressional Committee, the highest representation of the American people under subpoena to tell what I knew of activities, which I believe might lead to an attempt to set up a fascist dictatorship. The plan as outlined to me was to form an organization of veterans, to use as a bluff or as a club at least, to intimidate the government and break down our democratic institutions. The upshot of the whole thing was that I was supposed to lead an organization of 500,000 men which would be able to take over the functions of government. I talked with an investigator for this committee who came to me with a subpoena on a Sunday, November 18th. He told me they had unearthed evidence linking my name with several such veteran organizations. As it then seemed to me to be getting serious, I felt it was my duty to tell all I knew of such activities to this committee. Okay, so that plot to overthrow the government obviously didn't happen because Smedley D Butler told Congress that they were planning this and so they didn't do it. But there was other stuff going on. Uh, during that time, there were several different cult groups that were aligned with fascist ideology that started to get a lot of traction with the population. This is a group called the I Am Activity that was started in the early 1930s by Guy and Edna Ballard. And they were extremely anti-Roosevelt and anti-New Deal. They would go around the country uh, having these like seminars at big auditoriums where they would say, Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, blast, blast, blast their carcasses from the earth forever. Pretty serious stuff. The main guy that they venerate in the I Am cult is a, uh, a guy named Saint Germain who was sort of a made up quasi-historical character. 
Um, and they had a secret agent named K-17 in IM who claimed to have all of these connections throughout government, if that sounds at all familiar. Um, and uh, I think he looks a lot like Chris Elliott, but not everybody sees that. Uh, so, you know, you use your own judgment on that. But uh, let's fast forward a little bit to 1958. This is Robert Welch. Um, he is a member of the National Association of Manufacturers, which you recall before was so mad at Roosevelt. Um, and in the late 1950s, there was a, a feeling amongst that crowd that like creeping communism uh, after World War II was becoming a real problem in the United States. And it was really the same network of people that were annoyed about the loss of the gold standard in the 1930s. So Robert Welch was a candy manufacturer. He actually invented sugar babies and junior mints. Um, and he uh, helped to found an organization called the John Birch Society, which also had some ties to the IM cult. So the John Birch Society uh, is, was extremely concerned and still is concerned about uh, involvement with the UN and the idea that the UN is a creeping communist cult that's trying to subvert the US government. And they go around saying things like, this is a republic, not a democracy. That's a recent John Birch Society uh, poster. And John Birch was actually a uh, American soldier, a special forces uh, soldier, who was killed in China in the uh, final days of World War II. Um, so I love this one, you know, have you had enough coexistence with evil? Okay, all right, let's calm down, John Birch Society. So uh, in also around 1958, people connected with both John Birch and the IM Society, or I'm sorry, the IM Network, uh, founded something called the Freedom School. This guy on the left, Robert Lefebvre, um, was a former IM leader um, and also connected with the John Birch Society. And he went to Colorado to form this thing called the Freedom School, which you, know, you see a flag there, don't tread on me. And the people that were involved with the Freedom School uh, were really the founders of Austrian economics uh, and the people that popularized American libertarianism in the 20th century. So you know Ludwig von Mises and Murray Rothbard and von Hayek and Bal Bal um, Baldy Harper, uh, Rose Wilder Lane, as well as Charles Koch. So you really have this kind of marriage of the IAM cult, um, Austrian economics, the John Birch Society, and the Koch network coming together in around 1957-58. Another big shock that occurred was in 1971 when Richard Nixon actually moved uh, the country fully away from the gold standard by abandoning the Bretton Woods agreements that created a kind of rudimentary system for um, international settlement of payments between nations using gold. And this set the stage for the floating, uh, what you know people sometimes call the petrodollar and the kind of modern fiat currency that we have today. This action in 1971 set the gold bugs off like crazy. Um, the folks that were annoyed in 1933 who were still alive thought that this was the nail in the, in the coffin for the country. And so what you started to have throughout the 1970s was a very kind of renewed paranoia around monetary policy. So there were three books that you can kind of use to trace the evolution of this over the course of 1977 to 1997. The first being The War on Gold by Anthony C. Sutton. Um, who actually also worked with William Rees Mogg, who's a co-author of the other two books shown here. And each of these books kind of says the same thing. They basically assert that the move away from gold is creating this kind of like chaos in the world. And it also tends to echo Protocols of the Elders of Zion, the disinformational pamphlet that was popularized in Russia in around 1903. So you have this kind of conspiracy thinking around money that's becoming quite popularized. And you also notice on this, the Sovereign Individual book, which is referred to a lot by many people in the cryptocurrency world today, that uh, you know, it actually says how to survive and thrive during the collapse of the welfare state. So that's a pretty you know, intense point of view. Now, uh, you know, by the time you get to um, the current day, you know, you, you notice that this sovereign individual book has now been sort of picked up as a favorite by Peter Thiel. And he actually said it was the most important book that he ever read. They changed the title uh, of the book now, or the subtitle of the book, to be Mastering the Transition to the Information Age, as opposed to talking about the collapse of the welfare state, I think to make it a little bit more palatable. Um, and uh, you know, the, the founding vision for um, PayPal was really the vision that was outlined in the sovereign individual, which was um, that uh, they wanted to create a global world currency that would be um, you know, able to, to create a global pay payment system independent from government. 
And indeed, you see this intention actually really expressed uh, in the or in Genesis block of blockchain in 2009 when Satoshi Nakamoto released it. You see that um, you know the uh, headline that was in the uh, Times of London that day was reflected in the, the Genesis block. And this really speaks to this history of you know gold obsession uh, and you know dislike of the um, of fiat currency and central banks. So. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a real question around these technologies, like, you know, does intent and the design of an object or of a protocol actually matter? And I would argue that, yeah, you know, it actually does matter what the intent was. You could try to, like, you know, start doing coal mining using spoons and become really convinced that the only way to do that properly is with spoons. And that wouldn't be very efficient and it would probably be really painful and all of that. And likewise, you could try to design, you know, design a uh, car out of cheese puffs or something, but that's a pretty strange obsession. So the whole thing with crypto and Web3, it really comes out of this idea that trustlessness, above all, is the key design consideration that must override all other design considerations. And I would argue that that's not really a valid uh, point of view most of the time. And that's one of the reasons why many of the technologists I mentioned in the first uh, slide really, uh, you know, are rejecting uh, aspects of the crypto and Web3 world. But I'll speak about something that's perhaps a little bit more nefarious, um, which is the idea of network effects. And the fact that many people who don't support this reactionary, reactionary paranoid agenda that spans these several decades and is tied in with this whole history of gold buggery don't necessarily want to advance these ideas. However, by participating, and you know, causing network effects to occur where you're actually increasing the value of the project by participating in it at all, you are in fact advancing some of these goals. And so the question is, do you want to do that? Is that your intent? And so if it isn't your intent, if you don't want to be pulled into some of these reactionary uh, you know, histories that have been built up here, then you need to figure out some way to distance yourself from it or figure out why what you're doing is not the same as what these previous traditions have been calling for. So there's another aspect to this too, and I'm gonna call that community. And we hear community a lot when Web3 is mentioned. And one of the things that people don't really consider when they think about community is that it's a, it's a really loaded concept. You're really talking about a, a social construct. And one of the things that I've found in studying disinformation is that it really tends to create these kind of cult information environments that lead to a kind of a high control um, you know, uh, mindset for people that are participating in it. So for example, milieu control, this talks about uh, the people that are sort of allowed into a space to talk about something. And we see in crypto communities that quite, frank, quite, quite often there is an attempt to control what information uh, is allowed to be said about things and that people who are you know, spouting heresy are ejected from the community and that sort of thing. Likewise, mystical manipulation, and these, these are points that Robert J. Lifton, a noted uh, psychologist, has identified as being common to um, thought reform and totalitarianism. Um, so mystical manipulation, the idea that there are people who uh, are within these communities who have sort of higher powers, so people like Elon Musk or Michael Saylor, for example, uh, demand for purity, you know, either, you know, you've got to be fully committed to Bitcoin or blockchain or whatever, and if you're asking questions, you know, you're, you're creating FUD, that sort of thing. Um, confession, you hear this sort of thing in uh, things like Twitter spaces, people talking about their doubts and whether or not, you know, they, they really should be participating and how and all of that. Sacred science, the idea that the, that the technology is beyond question and that it's, if you actually understood it, then you wouldn't be asking all these questions. You clearly haven't spent enough time studying it. Loading the language, so things like NGMI and WAGME and GM and all this stuff that goes on in the crypto world is very much an insider's language that's meant to uh, kind of identify members of the in-group while also confusing members of the out-group. Doctrine over person, the idea that the uh, ideology of the group is more important than um, you know the, the individual concerns of participants and lastly the dispensing of existence that people who don't get it don't get it and shouldn't be allowed into the community anymore and you forget about the, the fact that they ever even existed so I love trying to undermine the value of trying to undermine
Um, I love the way that Dan Olson says this in his video, Line Goes Up, from earlier this year. Trying to undermine the value of your assets and manipulate a crash or trick you into being a paper hands. It all maps onto narratives of sin and deception, a chosen few who are privileged with advanced knowledge about the promised land which they can achieve by holding strong to the rituals and expelling all doubt. The end product is a self-organizing high control group. And the result... So that line, uh, the end result is a self-organizing high control group, I think actually really captures a lot of what's going on with the sociology of the crypto community. Um, trying to un So there's a lot said about DAOs, uh, distributed autonomous organizations, and the idea that they're democratic. I think that that's a really bad use of that word. I think that they're not democratic, that they're country clubs. For people who wish to participate in these networks and make decisions about them, sure, they do what they do, but they're not in any way democratic because the word democracy and the word democratic draws from the word demos, which means the entirety of the people of a nation. And that isn't what these things do. These are forcing technologies down people's throat who don't necessarily want them and um, you know, also imposing a variety of design constraints onto their use of those technologies. Um, lastly, I'll say about uh, the metaverse. Um, you know, you can say a lot of things about the metaverse. It's clearly, you know, virtual reality, augmented reality has been being developed for uh, at least 40 years. Um, and uh, my belief is that metaverse is a product, metaverse as used by meta is a byproduct of iOS 14.5. <laughs> you know, in effect, this started to crush Facebook's business model and they needed some way to basically say, hey, look, we have a future and we think we maybe know what it is. So we're gonna invest a ton of money into CapEx on the you know, future come that something great is gonna happen then. And I believe that uh, you know, ultimately this is a high friction environment that is gonna be very, very difficult to move people into. And uh, you know, I think people leaving, you know, like people like Sheryl uh, Sandberg leaving uh, Facebook are an indicator that perhaps uh, there's not as much here as, as people might think there are, but time will tell with that. To wrap up, I wanna talk about January 6th. Um, if there was one group that you could say was responsible for January 6th, it's a group called the Council for National Policy. The Council for National Policy was organized out of the John Birch Society. So the John Birch Society connected to the National Association of Manufacturers, John Birch Society, and then um, the Council for National Policy created in 1981. This group is, you know, who did, who planned and executed January 6th? And we need to ask ourselves, what is their agenda? How are they connected into this? And the fact of the matter is that the Council for National Policy is rife with crypto people, including Steve Bannon and Brock Pierce, uh, Brock Pierce is, of course, a close you know, friend of Steve Bannon's. They worked together on creating internet gaming entertainment in the early O's. And all throughout, if you study the propaganda being put out by the Council for National Policy Network, it's all about pushing crypto and various kinds of propertarianism. So I would just encourage people who are in this space to figure out how you're different from them, how you're going to reconcile your own personal beliefs with the networks of people that are benefiting from the advance of some of these technologies. And not all these technologies are you know, marked in this way. I think people need to take a good hard look though at where these things are coming from, what kind of uh, forces they're driving in society. And so for example, if you don't like what the Supreme Court's been up to lately, start asking questions about what these kinds of technologies do to democracies and whether they enhance them or erode them. Um, so I've written a very comprehensive 12,000 word piece for a publication called The Washington Spectator that outlines this in incredible detail, really covering the period of 1933 uh, up to uh, 2022. There's a QR code there if you want to uh, you know, scan that and go read the article. It's extremely detailed and um, you, know, you can go look up all the references yourself. But it wasn't until I started to understand this broader arc of these ideas and where they came from and who was driving them that I myself turned away from, tech, from crypto as a technology. So thank you.